Warning. Listening to this show may result in increased levels of inspiration, motivation, and innovation. Side effects can include the immediate urge to take massive action to build a better business and life for yourself and others. You've been warned. Welcome to Influencers Radio with your host, Jack Mize. And welcome back to another episode of Influencers Radio. Uh, Conflict. It's something that none of us want, yet it's something that we all experience at one time or another. But when it comes to business, uh, it can have devastating consequences. And whether it's a professional partnership or a family-owned business, sometimes business owners find themselves in the middle of a conflict and they just don't know how to resolve it. And it definitely, like I said, could have long-term impact on their business and on their success. Well, my guest today is Dana Garnett. She is a mediator and a CPA specializing in conflict strategy and helps businesses shed new light and opportunity on even the deepest divides. Dana, welcome to Influencers Radio. Thank you, Jack. Um, It's really uh, quite a pleasure to be here. Well, I will tell you that uh, what you do is just really fascinating to me. And I've been excited about having you on because um, you you really deal in the emotions. And to me, you know, when I think of conflict, especially in business, I like to think I'm a fairly logical person and and can apply troubleshooting and and things like that. But, um, you know, there's a lot of emotion that is involved when you're dealing with resolving conflicts, especially in business with partnerships and teams and employees. And before we get into the meat of, you know, the tactical things that you do, I have to ask, uh, what drove you into uh, this field that is definitely, uh, you know, complex and, and uh, something that to me, it seems like it'd be tough to, uh, to navigate when you're dealing with emotions. What what got you here? <laughs> um, good question. Uh, I was um, I had a career uh, in public accounting initially um, with one of the big eights, Coopers and Lye brand, and then I was working with a Coca Cola company um, domestically in the states and also internationally, and uh, early retired myself at one point um, when our twin daughters uh, had been uh, born. They were around three years old, actually, when I, when I early retired myself, because I was fortunate to be able to continue to trail my spouse um, in his work. And he and I had um, met working at the Coca-Cola company and um, had different assignments, to, in, in not, uh, not in the same roles, but in the same locations. And, um, so, and you that's what you call an expatriate trailing spouse, someone who's, you know, no, uh, not in a career internationally, but you continue to follow your spouse. So I, I, um, retired myself and, um, life went on. Um, the marriage was, uh, it wasn't the happiest of marriages. Um, uh, but you do what you do. And I think staying, uh, traveling all the time, moving from place to place, um, kind of kept, kept things going because you're always distracted by other things. And so um, that took us eventually to Thailand. Prior to that, I had worked in Nigeria, um, Belgium, and uh, many other places um, as an internal auditor internationally with the Coca-Cola company. But we ended up in Thailand and had a a beautiful stay there for seven years. And um, uh, one time we were on a family call and – my uh, my husband um, said he had uh, it said to me in a private chat um, he found a soulmate and he wanted a divorce and that at the moment struck me uh, blindside and um, I was uh, really in a state of shock for a, a number of months and we were in Thailand and so I've you know it. Long story short, my daughters and I ended up back in the States and we went through an embroiled divorce that was um, just so uh, full of anger and resentment. And we blew through all of our daughter's college savings. Um, We spent 
close to three hundred thousand dollars, two hundred seventy thousand on legal fees ultimately, and around thirty in therapy. It was, you know, such a waste and such a so devastating for our our daughters. Um, so I came out of that. and I was in a mediation. We were in mediation together, and I, um, you know, was talking to somebody. Uh, um, and, and <laughs> interestingly, it was my piano tuner. I had moved back to Dallas, and. He had come every six months to tune the piano, and he knew that I was going through these things, and we hadn't talked much. So this last meeting, he said, um, so how'd your mediation go? And uh, I said, it was horrible. I felt bullied and vulnerable, and it was just nobody should have to suffer this way, and, and I wish I could do something to help that. And he very casually just said, well, just why don't you become a mediator and do it better? And, and I, I just, I can't. I'm not an attorney. Um, and he said, you don't have to be an attorney. And I didn't know that we had had an attorney as a mediator. And, um, so I, I, you know, I, I said, well, how do you know this? You know? And, um, he said, well, I, I, I tune pianos just for fun, right? I'm a mediator. <laughs> uh, that's what I was about to say. Well, you got a pretty wise piano tuner there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. And, and so, um, and it just side note, he and I had gone to the same music school. My bachelor's degree is in is in music and voice performance and opera. And um, we had been alums at that school um, around the same time. We didn't know it. Um, so um, anyway, uh, yeah, it was small world. So within six weeks of that conversation, which is about within six weeks of my divorce decree, I went and took my first course uh, in one of the, it turns out, one of the top graduate programs in the country at, at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, SMU, and um, ended up, uh, I went through the entire master's degree program, and I never looked back. And one of my favorite, I mean, I was so fascinated with this one course called the Neuroscience of Conflict, and I um, learned all about um, how we are wired physiologically a certain way, and, and we have choices around what we uh, how we respond to things, and we can um, we can alter our situation ourselves if we just know how. And along at that same time, I became certified in different modalities. And, and um, through that whole process, I, um, you know, spent two through two and a half three years getting my master's degree and 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 you know becoming this mediator that I. Uh, can now, you know, help other people not, you know, not feel bullied by the process or, or also, you know, help them get to resolution more quickly and with lasting change. Too often, you know, you leave a mediation and, um, or a conflict, whatever, and, you know, everyone on the surface, it seems settled, quote unquote, but you really haven't resolved anything, you know, and that's where I wanted to make a difference. So I, I in, in this period of study and, and, and training and learning, I experienced something called post-traumatic growth and, um, you know, from my PTSD and my shock and all of that. And I came to realize that this unhappy marriage um, and this, you know, um, treacherous divorce and all of that, I really had been contributing to my own misery in many ways. I just didn't realize that at the time. And I had a, this awakening this new place where I, I saw everything so differently and, you know, all that finger pointing exercise that, you know, it's somebody else doing something to me, you know, this is, this is the cause of my misery. In fact, it was how I was showing up. It was what I was saying and doing and processing. And, and, and so I learned uh, very quickly within 18 months, in fact, of my divorce decree, I was recovered from my divorce. And I had, you know, met so many uh, women, particularly ahead of me, who had given me wonderful, heartfelt advice as to how to get through their divorce. And I um, would listen intently. And, and at the end of each story, they would say, you know, and he's still a bastard, you know, or my children are still suffering or, you know, or I hated every minute. I, you know, I have still got, gotten over that. And I thought, how can I, you know, do I, how do I? not be that person. Right. And when I became a mediator, I also, you know, in, in the reason I, you know, I, I love helping people through conflict is no matter what the conflict is, you, you get freed from whatever that past recycling of the issues are. And these 
people I was talking to, their, their situation was, you know, 5, 10, 20 years ago, but they were talking about it still like it was today. And what I learned about our physiology um, and neuroscience behind that is that when we retell a tragedy, we, we retell a story, or we, or we get worked up about something in the moment, our body doesn't know the difference between whether it was 20 years ago or right now. And so we are recreating that same cortisol buildup, that same stress, that same taxing on our immune system. Uh, and it, over time, can lead to illness and dis-ease or disease. So I, I was learning all this stuff. And I was like, wow, you know. So I ended up, um, you know, when I became a mediator, I, I stepped into the realm of what they call alternative dispute resolution. Um, there are different styles of mediation. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, from my own mediation. Um, so I, I, you know, I approach it from a, um, burst, not a, an evaluative method style, but from a facilitative or transformative style, guiding people to their best solution from, with their, from their own insights and their own uh, creative problems, uh, uh, solve, solutions, if you will. And, you know, not advising them, telling them what they should do. That's, that's what I learned is, you know, to be an effective mediator or effective conflict coach, if you will, um, is to guide a process where you're not telling them what to do, but you're guiding it so they find their best solution. That's when you're going to get lasting change. That's when you're going to get, you know, things resolved so you can move on with your life. Uh, I think that's really what what what, what makes it a, a huge difference between what you are doing, and I think a lot of people think about uh, conflict, you know, mediation or, or conflict resolution. Because you know, my my thought about a, a, a mediator is, well, this is a referee, right? This is a referee that comes in and decides how things are, are going to be. Uh, you know, we're going to take care of this problem. But just as you explained, uh, the lasting damage that can be done because it is true, even after the issue might be resolved technically, just like you, you talked about, some of these people are, are held hostage by these feelings and these emotions for, for many years to come and perhaps for the rest of uh, their lives. And for you to be able to come in there and almost to not just be a referee, but almost like that hostage negotiator is just phenomenal. And what a huge difference that that uh, can make on, on people's lives. And I think you clearly illustrated that a lot of these conflicts are an emotional level. I think probably you could probably go in and look at a conflict on a logical level, say, okay, well, here's, here's the answer, but how do you convince or impart that on the parties that you're working with. So if we take, for example, like a partnership, uh, you, you certainly had the benefit of, of uh, being able to be pretty introspective to yourself and, and, and um, uh, understanding what you're going through. But how do you transfer that knowledge or that feeling or that motivation to the people that you're uh, working with so that they can experience that? Um, great, great insights. Um, and, and, and again, a great, a great question, you know, mediation, uh, the media is a referee. Um, uh, uh, I, I liked, I liked how you put that earlier. Um, and how do I get them there? Basically there, there are two, there's a, there are two approaches when, when people are in such conflict, um, that is not the time to go in and say, okay, we're going to talk about neurologically what's happening with you and you're going to, we're, we're going to approach it in, in, with this process, right? I don't talk about that, that. Their bandwidth is so limited at that moment. You know, if you're, if you're embroiled in conflict and you can't see straight because of it, um, that's when I, that's what I call coming in with intervention. Later we can teach about prevention to not get there again. Um, but in the moment, in that heated moment, um, I, I tap in to what's at the heart of the matter indirectly. And it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a 
it is a process I'm using, but I'm not, I don't talk about that process in that moment, but I'm basically asking each of the parties either individually or jointly, if they're open to working out something, you know, together in the same space, um, you know, guessing around what they're really needing. We also, we often talk about positions and interests and negotiations, right? But at the end of the day, it's an emotional need or value that someone has that un- until that's met the feelings that they're experiencing of anger or, or um, uh, resentment or aggression or whatever. It's like, that's not going to go away when our, when our emotional needs and values are met, everything's great. It's when something is not meeting that need or that those needs are not being met, you know, that's when, not just conflict shows up, but the unnecessary escalation of it. So, but I, I, I will be honest. I don't, I'm not sitting here saying, okay, now we're just going to talk about your emotional needs. <laughs> it's really more about just listening and understanding. And I'm, and I, um, you know, at some point uh, when I think the time when the moment is appropriate, asking them to put each other in each other's shoes But I have to be careful there, too, because when people are really deep into conflict, they need to be heard and understood, period. So there's not like a a checklist that, you know, okay, first I do this, do do this, and and, uh, then once this occurs, do this. There seems to be a lot of variables, and and you're having to do more reacting to how they are, uh, their responses to this versus a here's the steps to resolving something. Exactly. Yeah. Because every situation is unique and it's easy to say, Oh yeah, this, you know, this case or this, this conflict or this partner dispute. Yeah. Writings on the wall. You can see how it started and how it's going to play out. No, if you go in as a mediator or, or, you know, in my case, a conflict strategist or coach, you, you make presumptions and you don't park your judgments and opinions at the door. You are not helping those people. (laughs) You know, I have got to be that, you know, um, the most patient and the most curious person in the room and the least important. My opinions don't matter. It's like a paramedic showing up to a car crash. The paramedic does not show up going, oh, my God, is, is everybody OK? I can't believe what's happened. Right. That's making what's happening about the paramedic and how they feel. They show up and say, please step aside. We need to take your pulse. Okay, whatever's happening. And they do their job in that moment. So um, that, you know, that's, that's what a mediator is showing up as, is, you know, not making it about them. You're engaged in what's going on, but you're detached yourself emotionally. Um, and that's when you find out the unique things to this specific situation. And you begin to understand why each person is coming from where they are and you guide it from, from that place. And I will tell you, Jack, every single time I have worked with, you know, a small business, um, uh, with their, with just the owner for themselves or their team and, and worked with around disputes. I never, I mean, what I may have presumed was, was the heart of the matter isn't. Because it's not my world. I don't have these histories. I don't know these people. And um, I don't, I mean, I should not bring any kind of presumption into it. So to help, so circling back, you know, I, I help them to see the way forward by listening carefully and following what they're telling me. And just, and just going with that, because if I try to change the course and say, I, I know you want to talk about that, but can we go back to this? No, they need, you, you cannot get from A to B to C down to Z unless you address every single thing that that person is needing to express. That's how you get there. And when they begin to feel heard and understood, progress is made. Speaking of presumptions, when, when I think of you know mediation or, or resolution, um, you know I, I think of it as like like a, a divorce, and even in business, I think okay, well, it's a 
you know, a dispute, say it's a, a partnership that this is and like a divorce. This is uh, partners that are going their separate ways and the mediation or the resolution is, is, you know, who gets what, but if I'm understanding correctly, some of this are maybe businesses and partnerships or, or people on their teams that, no, 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 we, we don't want to go our separate ways. We want to work this out. And I can imagine that that, to me, would be um, create even more difficulty. And how do, how do I not um, inflame or antagonize this by bringing up all this this stuff? Um, versus they've already decided they're going their separate ways. I just got to figure out what's a, a fair r- resolution. Uh, do, do you find that to be a, a difference in, in how you would approach things when you're working with folks that, that want to work something out and stay together versus something? No, we've made our decision. We just need to decide who gets what. Yeah, no, a- a- excellent um, uh, point. Absolutely. Yeah. In a divorce, people are going, or even a partner dispute where they decide to end the partnership and you're done, you walk away. But so many times it is a situation where you have your, your company, your business, your organization, and, you know, we don't want this to fail because we can't get along. And so, you know, everybody needs to stay together, wants, wants to, if it weren't for X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. And so, how do you get, I, I understand your question to be, how do you get these people to, um, this, this, and, and when I say these people, it's usually in my work, it's a small organization, you know, um, up to 100 employees, you know, per the Small Business Administration, you know, that small businesses, 99 employees or less. And I work with these businesses, by the way, because, you know, I f- believe they are the backbone of our economy. And whether you are a family business because families don't just break apart when things, you know, or you hope they don't when, when things go awry. Um, but if the family starts having dynamic issues, it's going to affect the business and everyone's wherewithal, you know, and the legacies that you hope to pass on can be taken out in a heartbeat if, if the conflict has escalated so much and, and people, you know, cannot work through these things. Small businesses where they're not just, they're not family necessary, necessarily, but they have been together for so long or because there's so few of them, right, in the business that they operate like a family, the same dynamics. So, yeah, how do you get this family or this group of people to stay together? You know, that, you know, again, I would, I come in with intervention if I, if there's an immediate need. Um, And once we get down to the heart of the matter and everyone's feeling heard and understood, now we can progress to, okay, how do we communicate going forward? How do you avoid this unnecessary buildup? You know, because conflict's going to happen. It's inevitable. We have our opinions. We have our, you know, ideas and, and, and we're going to agree and, and disagree and agree to disagree. That's okay. That's healthy. We never want to squash or avoid the feelings that come up. When we're in a conflict, people that want to avoid conflict, that's as unhealthy as unnecessary conflict getting out of hand. Um, it, cause it's just, it's like under the radar stress, just building, building, building. We're trying to avoid things. That's the elephant in the room, right? That's, that's not going to help either. When you can have a safe, open environment where people understand how to communicate with each other, um, now you can prevent the unnecessary stuff from blowing up and your business can get back on track and you have a way to operate now from a, a new level of awareness. Um, and everyone has a choice in that. And, and it, it, you know, when you come to that new place as, as a team in the organization, you will, you know, you have a, a new perspective on your role and of each other and you value each other from a different place now. And, um, and all of this, by the way, it doesn't have to take, you know, years to get there. This work, the application of neuroscience-based social-emotional intelligence skills and learning that we're not taught in school, <laughs> that's part of the problem. We don't learn this stuff when we're little. <laughs> we grow up with, you know, with things that ha- stuff that happens to us. And our, we, you know, we become adults with stuff. <laughs> and um, one of the talks I do is, you know, have you cleared enough of your stuff to show up as fill in the blank, a leader, a leader, right? Um, a supervisor, 
a parent even, you know, um, and, and I work with, I, I, I teach this to mediators as well. You know, are you, have you worked through enough of your stuff to show up as that person who's that neutral party to guide the process through? Can you stay engaged and detached? So, um, cause we all have stuff and, um, but it doesn't take, it doesn't have to have, you know, years of therapy to clear that up. So it's really, and, and what I have seen the last bit of this is when these teams are working through the issues, you know, first you've got to let them just let everything be put out there. Every, and everybody in the room, I mean, the owners, the presidents, the vice presidents, whoever, everybody's in the room and this stuff comes up and then you, you process it, but it can get processed very quickly. Um, like in a matter of just, you know, a couple of hours, I've had a, a team where, uh, you know, everything that they always wanted to say, felt that they never could say it, not only brought it up, but worked through it in a couple of hours. And then, and then the follow-up on that is, you know, so, so how do you communicate with each other going forward? Don't fall back into old habits, right? But it's not rocket science. It's so really simple to understand how to relate to each other um, that in, in, in a way that, that allows for disagreement, but not, you know, debilitating conflict. And so if, if can you imagine every small business had this opportunity to, or had, you know, knew how to connect with each other and to collaborate with each other um, and, and have a healthy, healthy business. If you have a healthy business emotionally and dynamically, you're going to have a healthy business financially. You will profit from that. So let's say that someone says, you know, yes, this is something that uh, I need. This is something I think that can um, put us back on track. So my question is, does everyone involved in this conflict have to be on board to uh, start the process, right? Is it something that people have to be in agreement on, or is it something that someone could say, look, you know, I'm one party in this, and I'd really like to get this resolved, but... Uh, the other party, I haven't really talked to them about it, and I don't know if they are really interested in doing something like that. Um, is there a, a way to 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 uh, get this rolling, even if, if all the parties aren't on board? Absolutely, um, and 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 interestingly, that's where most of my um, that's where most of the uh, inquiry comes to me. Most of my work is usually starts out with someone approaching me, an individual. Uh, either in the organization or um, or the owner of the organization or top management and says, um, we've got a problem and no one can see it. And I'm really worried. Um, but if, you know, if you come in here, I know they're going to say, oh, no, no, we don't need to come you know, have somebody fix her. You know, we don't have any problems. You know, so so it's 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 most often I'm work, I start working with one person. And the beautiful thing is, is that even if you don't have that opportunity or, or the, you know, the, 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 the way that the, the, the group works together, you know, it's, it's not, it's going to create more issue to try to tell everybody, okay, we're going to have this wonderful training and you're going to learn, we're going to learn how to get along with each other. Nobody wants to be told that. <laughs> <laughs> that does not meet their need to be seen for who they are, <laughs> you know. Um, but the beautiful thing is it only takes one person, that one person that comes wanting things to be different. Working with them helps them to shift to a new place of awareness. And like I said about myself, I didn't realize what I was contributing to my own misery. We, we, we often don't realize what we may be doing, even innocently. I'm not, this is not dissing ourselves or, or, you know, putting some guilt trip on ourselves, right? It's like, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, we don't know what we're contributing most of the time or, or that we think we're trying to help, but it's just creating more problems. You know, how many times you've heard someone say, no matter what I do, no one seems to appreciate what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to help with here, Right. Well, maybe what we're doing is not really that effective, but we just, we don't understand why. So when you make that shift and you understand how, you know, how you can approach things differently or, or how, how to deal with the, the ones that you are most concerned with, right? It just takes that one person 
and it can shift an entire situation and create, it, it's like it just transforms it so that the situation is, and, and often not just for the better, but for good. And no one, no one needs to even know you, you have gone to get help. You know, you don't, no one, it, it, you're not broadcasting, you know, oh, great, things are better, let me tell you why. No, <laughs> you can just keep that to yourself. <laughs> and everybody's just fine, you know. Now, if, if at that point you get to that, not if, but when you get to that point, and you, and you feel like, you know, there's an opportunity to, to you know, people now more open to um, learning more and, and people can be, others can become aware for themselves, then, you know, that's when, you know, I, I would introduce what I call a conflict management uh, system. We have payroll systems and um, sales systems and, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, accounts payable systems. Why not a conflict management system? You know, how do we, what is, what is the process we're going to use uh, or, or just what, what is that awareness we're going to have to not go down that slippery slope again and start, you know, backbiting each other, undermining each other, and then the business starts to suffer again and maybe even fail if it's a small business. So, um, but that one person is all it takes. And uh, it, it's, it's quite powerful. And that's because we ha- when we show up, there's a whole lot of neuroscience behind this, but we have this, this um, field around us. Right, and when we show up with stress and tension, we're going to feed that into that space, into that field. But when we show up from a new place of awareness, and we are literally, you know, putting others before ourselves, which sounds ludicrous, I know it some, sometimes. But when the more we put ourselves into other people's shoes um, than our own, that's actually the least path of resistance, and and it's actually the best way to self-preserve. And for me, though, it, it, it seems like it's also one of the more difficult things for people to do, because I, I keep thinking of this as if uh, uh, like in a divorce that in, in, in even in any conflict that people may come to you with, you know, I really would like to resolve this. But if you really translate that to their true feelings, the, the, I, I can imagine it's the, they're really saying, I want you to help me win this. And and there's got to be a difference, I think, between winning and a, 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 a resolution. Because I guess winning implies that someone is losing. Right. And I imagine you have to tackle that head on pretty quickly. Uh, you know, what do you do when someone comes to you and you sense that they're not interested in a resolution, they're interested in winning? Um, I would say winning at what cost? Ah, yeah. You know, well, that's a way to put it very quickly. Will, <laughs> yeah, winning at what cost? People will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars to be right. They will battle it out with the attorneys. They will insist until the cows come home, you know, that they are right. And what does that cost you? Not just in money, but the stress on your, on your health. And sadly, the, the heart attacks we see of people, you know, in very stress and in, in stressed environments, you know, we, if we can't let go of stuff, then, you know, we, we are really creating a, a, an environment for us to become really sick. And um, so, yeah, at what cost, you know, it, do, it, do you want to be right does that help answer that? Question? That's an, an excellent answer. I mean, it, 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 you you shined a really bright light on it very quickly for me. And you're talking about stress and yeah. how much stress this is. Um, you know, right now, as we're talking, we're in the middle of this COVID pandemic. And, the you know, businesses have pressures on them that they couldn't even conceive of a year ago. And I'm sure that any underlying conflicts – that there may have been or maybe repressed or being ignored um, are just amplified uh, exponentially during this time. Um, what is, is something that, that someone could do to, to relieve some of that or how would you approach that? And, and is that something that you're dealing with a lot now? Yeah, sadly, um, there's been a lot of suffering, and there still is, and there will be uh, until we're through this pandemic. And who knows? And may, you know, we may be 
may take us into the next year or so. Um, but um, yeah, the, the the issues that were already there in in the in the business world, the small business, family business world, particularly like sibling rivalries, right? Um, um, after a parent has has died, this are still rife, you know, and now that the, the business is more stressed because of COVID or, you know, there's control of the family trust that that's at the issue or the a parent worried about handing over the business to um, a son or a daughter uh, because they, they think they might squander the legacy, you know, that the parent has built up. Um, all of these are, are normal things that, that exist. Um, but you put COVID on top of that, it, you know, it, it's, um, it just exacerbates everything. So um, basically, we it goes back to um, what I said a moment ago about at what cost, you know, and, and how much time, energy, and money do you do you want to um, lose basically in spinning in this in this cycle of um, retribution, you know, anger, resentment, whatever. And, 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 you know, cause, cause with, with COVID at play, um, not only does, does the stress just make the situation worse, but stress, and this is, this is something I'd lead with when I do talks, particularly to uh, business forums, um, that, you know, stress is in effect a form of hurried aging. Hmm. And most people, you know, I feel can relate to, you know, not wanting to age more quickly than we would normally. And um, some people don't want to age at all. And that's, that's another issue. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I've always, I was, I've always believed every birthday come, we can't keep birthdays from happening, right? So we might as well celebrate them, right? It's another year wiser. That's another topic. But anyway, but Hurried aging is what we're bringing on, on ourselves um, if we don't curb the stress. You know, in the house, so how do you curb the stress? Well, it, there's some very simple, simple tools and processes. Again, we're not taught this stuff in school that can self-regulate your emotions. And it's not, I mean, I love, there are moments to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. This is not what I'm talking about. This is like, in the moment, real time resolution approaches to where you can not have to succumb to this coronavirus pandemic period that we're in and, and, and eventually break down. You know, but you can ride the tide. You can continually renew yourself and shift to this new place of awareness that ultimately up levels your health, you know. Um, not just your your physical and personal health, but your business health. You know, and the more the more we can ride that tide and understand how to go with the flow. You know, it, it's it it just makes all the difference. And one thing to add is that when we are in a constant state of conflict, we're therefore in a constant state of stress. And I'm not talking about you know knock down drag out stuff all the time. I mean under the radar stuff. You know, things that it's like why does your phone battery die? too quickly. Well, because you have 50,000 windows open up in the background, right? You have all these apps running that you forgot about, right? That's kind of, that's the analogy here. It used to be, you know, why did your battery die? Because you left your lights on overnight in the car, but cars don't do that anymore. We have systems to prevent that, but the phone's a great analogy. And so we don't, um, you know, let's, 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 let's close down those apps. Let's, let's get rid of all that stuff running under the radar that's eating up our health and overtaxing our immune system and distracting our immune system from fighting the virus. We need to, we need to stay healthy as possible. And, you know, we need, you know, respecting what the situation is and, um, and, and, ride through it as healthily as we can. So yeah, emotional health, the the dynamics of a business, of a family, how we interact with each other, we owe it to ourselves. It's not being selfish. It's just being aware. Well, I, I, I just can't help but thinking how, you know, just about any 
business, I mean, conflict is part of life and just about any business, um, depending on their level, I, I mean, needs a Dana in their life. I can imagine uh, how much you could um, contribute to the bottom line of a business because there's something. The only business I can think of that wouldn't work well with you is, is I think you could probably wipe out the professional wrestling industry in about two days because they, 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 they need conflict, right? You're like the last thing they want to see. Um, well, actually, you know what? Even with wrestlers, no, they, uh, this stuff, it's another topic, but this, this, these tools and, and process at all, they're used with Olympic athletes as well as first responders. You mentioned hostage negotiations earlier. I was actually invited to speak to the Texas Association of Hostage Negotiators last year. And um, I was heard at a mediation conference and someone walked up and said, wow, hostage negotiators need to hear about this stuff. And, and you know, this, this, this approach is being used ac- across the board. I just happen to focus on family businesses because, and small businesses because I do believe they're the backbone of the economy and they need as much support as they can get. But a wrestler can learn how to de-stress outside of the ring and they're even stronger in the ring for it. Yeah, but you don't want to you don't want to 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 resolve those conflicts between the good guys and the bad guys that would that would ruin the rating. So Oh that yeah, that's, <laughs> that's sport, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Someone's gotta win there. That's okay. And if everybody knows that, so that's okay. But as far as a wrestler who wants to preserve, you know, who wants to wrestle for as long as they can, um there's there's a way to uh, to take care of yourself and be able to do both, have have health, and uh, also um, kill him in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it seems like this is as much of an art as it is a science. You know, your ability to to have insights and how quickly you have to understand a situation. Um, it's just remarkable to me. And it's definitely a reason that I feel that you are a, an influencer. And I think not only, you know, for businesses, but I think there's probably a lot of people in the mediation and resolution industry that uh, could take a page um, um, from your book. And so uh, if someone wanted to find out more about uh, Dana Garnett, uh, what, what do they need to do? Um, just simply go to my website, which is um, mindfulstrategy.com or www.mindful with one L strategy.com. Um, the mindful comes from um, uh, through my expatriate travels. I uh, we ended up in Thailand and we spent seven years there. I mentioned I learned about mindfulness and Reiki energy healing and transcendental meditation. You know, and um, had an awakening on on a you know energetic level, if you will. But I hadn't had the emotional awakening awakening for my for myself. Um, you know, when I that was the mediation t- uh, training and all of that. But the strategy part of my business is that experience with Coca-Cola company where I, you know, witnessed across the globe, um, mom and pop shops selling Coca-Cola, you know, and, and family businesses there. Right. And, and trying to make ends meet and, and worrying about uh, issues in their business back in Cooper's and Libran days, working in the emerging business, uh, world and, and working with small and family businesses um, with, and, the, and the strife you see that they can get into. Um, and I, I, I will say that I used to, um, you know, audit um, small businesses. Today, I audit the dynamics of them. And, you know, I can't help but think the whole time I'm talking to you today is, man, where was she when the Beatles broke? <laughs> man, what a different world this would be. I would have loved that challenge. Yes. <laughs> I, I just can imagine you sitting there, you know, it's like, okay, look, yeah, Ringo, you can sing one or two more songs, you know, we'll, we'll let you do that. Um, but we really need to work on uh, John and Paul here. So that's what they needed. They, they didn't need to go off to <laughs> India or, 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 you know, they, they needed a, 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 a Dana. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, nothing brings me more joy than helping people get to the, you know, the heart of the conflict and the re- conflict and the resolution really quickly so that they can get on with their lives. That That's, that's what it's all about for me. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't love the conflict. I love, I love the relief they get from it being resolved. Well, I think the big difference in what, at least what I've seen 
is is resolving the conflict is step one with you. It's that getting on with their lives that I think that you have the biggest impact on. And um, and that's why I, I you know feel that you're an influencer because when you help them, that's where that that you know help them not be hostage to those emotions or to the the, the results. Uh, then you've you've impacted not just them but you know everyone around them. And to me, that's just um, yeah. magical. So I, I definitely want to thank you for for uh, coming on today and sharing this. And, and I think you, you, you're making a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. Thank, thank you, Jack. And I, if I may add this, that, you know, I walk the walk and talk the talk for myself. Otherwise, you know, I, I can't show up to be the greatest help. And that starts with, goes back to my own story. Um, uh, today, um, my uh, daughters um, are, you know, really in a better place because of what I discovered for myself, their dad and I, um, we get along fine. We actually took a vac- a family vacation, um, last year over the girls spring break. They're both in college the twins. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it can work out, you know, um, it, you can work together and stay together and work through things. You can decide to not stay together and still work through things. It's, it's possible. And so I have to, you know, I have to um, make sure I'm doing, you know, I, I do what I teach. Well, I, I think that's what you're doing. You're making a lot of things possible that people thought were impossible. So um, they, they keep doing, doing what you're doing and, and it's going to be interesting to continue following and, and seeing what you're doing. And I think a lot of people can learn from you and like I say, not just businesses, but other mediators and conflict resolutions. So, um, all right, folks, well, there you have it. Definitely check out Dana's website. We'll put the, uh, all the information there on the, uh, the show notes for you. Um, and until next time on influencers radio, remember you are the only real game changer. You've been listening to Influencers Radio. To get all past shows and updates on future shows, visit InfluencersRadio.com today. 